talk about importing from China like a pro. Basically, this is going to be 10 hacks that you can use to import from China quicker, easier, and more quickly. Before we get started, I can work my PowerPoint, that's the first step. Next month, April 26th, we'll be doing a mastermind in Hong Kong, a little sales pitch in the beginning. So April 26th, just in uh, just across the bay in basically the Hong Kong side, we'll be doing a mastermind. This is our second annual mastermind. We did it last year at the same time of the year. It happens to fall right in between phase two and phase three of the Canton Fair. So if you're heading over there, and a lot of people in this webinar probably are, check it out. The link is here at the bottom, uh, ecomcrew.com slash mastermind. Basically, it's 25 people. We all get together in a room, all e-commerce sellers, all importers from China. We all get together in a room. Everyone gets 15 minutes to talk about a problem that they're having in their business right now. And then the whole group as a whole gives feedback. And last year was a big success. I think everybody got uh, at least something out of it. And if you have time, definitely check it out, ecomcrew.com slash mastermind. And... This week, we also have Ecom Crew Premium open. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Ecom Crew Premium, it's basically our paid uh, version of Ecom Crew. And in it, you get four courses, full length courses. Uh, I think Mike would agree these are arguably the most professionally well produced e commerce courses that are out there. And you get four of them right now. We have another one re uh, coming out in April called Flows to Riches. It's basically an email marketing course. So you get that. Included for free with your premium membership. Uh, we also do bi-weekly webinars. So every other week we do a webinar. We do a webinar and we also do secret sauce webinar where we get some expert to come in and talk about some uh, part of e-commerce marketing, whether it's, uh, I think, two weeks. We have uh, Fabio coming on to talk about Instagram marketing. A couple of weeks ago, we had somebody do uh, basically doing photography, photography for cheap. So they're always interesting and that's included with your premium membership. You get our private Facebook group. Uh, you get all our vendor lists, service uh, lists and swipe files and tons of other basically different types of media and files that you can use in your e-commerce business. And the link for that is econcrew.com slash premium. Okay, on to the good stuff. So the first hack, I'm basically gonna walk you guys through the whole supply chain of importing from China. So getting your products, going to China and then actually shipping your products over here. And the first step is once you found your product, it's negotiating low prices for them. So the big trick with getting low prices, number one is you want to get competing quotes. If you don't know what the price of your item should be and you haven't gotten competing quotes, it's pretty tough to determine if you're getting a good price or a bad price. So that's the number one, get competing quotes. Uh, once you've done that though, and you kind of know the fair price of your product, couple quick and easy things that you can do to get better prices. So rule of thumb with China, when you're ordering larger, you get larger discounts. So if you order a thousand garlic presses instead of a hundred, then you're going to get a cheaper price. Now, most of us don't want to order big quantities because what happens is that you're going to have all your cash flow tied up. You're going to have high storage costs. So most of us try to order small and probably three to four month order quantities. Now the trick though is if you give your supplier an order schedule six to nine months out in advance. So for example, right now you're placing an order in March, you give them a, an order schedule for the next six months, basically till the end of September. So, okay, Mr. Wang, we're going to order 500 garlic presses today and in three months from now, we're going to order another 500 garlic presses. We're not going to pay you for those uh, second batch of 500 garlic presses, but you know it's coming. That allows them to plan their ordering uh, for their parts and components better. It also allows them to plan their labor schedules and all these other things. And what's going to happen is even though you're only paying for 500 garlic presses right now, they're basically going to give you the price for a thousand garlic presses. But if you have a predictable order schedule, you know that you're every three months you're ordering X, Y, Z units of your product, give them an order schedule a few months in advance. See if you can get better prices. Normally you'll get some type of favorable pricing when you do that. Number three, get prices in RMB and USD. A lot of people don't realize that the currency of China is not the US dollar. <laughs> All suppliers quote us in US dollars, but they're, the currency in China is of course uh, the renminbi. Now what they're doing is when they get their prices, suppliers have their own prices. When they get those prices, what they're doing is they're converting those prices into USD for our convenience. 
Now, what happens though, when you place an order, if it's March, you're placing a deposit right now. Now, by the time that you actually make that final payment, which is probably one or two months from now, there's a lot of currency risk. The exchange rate could go up or it could go down in favor or disfavor of your supplier. So what they're doing is they're, they're baking in a three to 5% risk factor into that conversion rate when they give you the prices in US dollars. So ask your supplier for prices in RMB and USD, and that way you can at least see how much of an exchange rate uh, markup they're putting on for the prices. And again, it's one more avenue for negotiation. Now, negotiating prices is actually quite hard now in China. Prices are more or less fixed. So it's best if you're trying to get a lower landed cost to negotiate beyond price. And this really helps with your landed cost because we all know the price that you get in China, that is not the ultimate cost that you're paying. There's a million other things that go into that price of a widget in China. So the first thing you do, again, you've ordered this great product. Uh, you probably ordered a sample. What happens is you order the sample and you probably paid a few hundred dollars to open the sample fee and the shipping over to you. And your supplier probably told you, well, Dave, once you make your first order, we'll give you back those sample fees and the shipping fees. Now, the thing is, if you don't ask to get those fees added back to you on your, real, your first real order, they won't give them to you. You have to ask for them. So make sure that you ask to get those sample fees paid back to you when you do make that first order. Second one, product defect compensation. Everybody is going to get product defects when they order something from China. If you order 100 widgets, you're probably going to get two or three that are just defective for whatever reason. It's hard to avoid, even with as, uh, every inspection in the world, you're going to get some product defects. So what we do, every time a customer complains about a product defect, we get them to take a picture of that product, and we log that photo into a folder and when we make our next order with that supplier, we say, okay, thanks, we're gonna order a thousand garlic presses. By the way, 10 of our garlic presses that you sent us last time were defective. Here's the photos. Please send us 10 new ones on the next order. Almost impossible for them to argue with you when you do it that way. And they'll just send you those free replacements uh, free of charge. Next one, payment terms. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that Chinese suppliers will do payment terms. so. If you deal with wholesale in North America, you know that normally you have like net 30. You pay for your goods 30 days after you receive them. Most Chinese suppliers will do some type of payment term uh, arrangement with you if they trust and know you. The big key is that they have to trust and know you. You have to be going to China on a regular basis. You probably have to have a relationship with them for at least one to two years. Uh, but if you have that, normally you can negotiate some type of more favorable payment terms at a very minimum, 100% payment or your items ship, uh, or in our case, actually, we've managed to negotiate where we pay about 70% of our goods uh, 30 days after they come into port. And that frees up a lot of cash flow when you can do it that way. Uh, next, free shipping. We're all e-commerce entrepreneurs here. We all do free shipping on our products. Um, we bake a lot of that cost into our product prices, but we don't bake everything in there. I mean, it does work out favorable for the consumer uh, to some degree. And the same thing with Chinese suppliers. They love free shipping too. They don't want to give a, they don't want to give a $2,000 price discount, but for some reason they'll uh, more than happily pay for the price of a container to ship it over uh, to wherever you are in the world. Uh, you might not be, depending on your order quantity and size, you might not be able to get completely free shipping, but you can probably at least work out where you guys, you pay half of the shipping and they pay the other half. And finally, packaging costs. Um, if your order volume has been going up significantly over the last year or two, all of a sudden you've gone from ordering 1,000 widgets to 10,000 widgets, you can tell your supplier, well, you know, Mr. Wang, we want to have full color boxes now. We're going to order a lot more thanks to these improved marketing materials that we're going to have, but we want you to pay for the packaging cost. You're going to win because you're going to get more order volume from us, and we're going to win because we get prettier packages. Hey, Dave. Yep. Your sound isn't really all that good, and uh, I thought it was just me, but there's someone else who was mentioning it too. I don't know if there's anything. The, um, is it the echo or is it the microphone? It's like everything, and, uh, and the internet's like chopping out some as well, but it's like very echoey. Uh, that fiend here says it's uh, distance, distant and jittery. I think that's probably a pretty good. Uh, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Let me see if I can. It's because I'm going off the computer microphone. Let me just try to get this Yeti hooked up.
Dave had like his nice yeah. microphone hooked up to start with, but then it wasn't working. So yeah, Mark says Dave's audio is a little choppy. Sounds like the LA woman recording session echo chamber. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, guys, bear with us for a minute. Keep the, uh, the good analogies coming. Those are good. So I'll go through a couple of Q&A while Dave's doing that. Uh, the first one here was from Blake. He's, uh, Blake is actually a premium member. So Blake, if you ever have questions like this, uh, feel free to email in anytime. Uh, but when I ship 97 kilos, what's the best way to ship it? Uh, 97 kilos is a, is a pretty small amount, uh, you know, depending on if you're shipping feathers or, uh, or something more dense. But 97 kilos in general is pretty small. You're almost always going to want to airship 97 kilos. It's probably the cheapest and most efficient way. Um, and if it's under, uh, it used to be $800, but I think it's $2,500 now, uh, then no import tax. But definitely air shipment. Uh, can you hear me now, Mike? I can. Perfect. Okay. So we're on the Yeti now. You can't see me, I'm sure. I cannot see you. That's good. For everybody's benefit. <laughs> okay. Start video. I'll read one more question here while Dave finishes getting set up. Uh, how do you deal with ASIN investigations, hard and soft closes with private label? Uh, for example, when you can't control the product quality, uh, we sell electronics that are more complex and harder to inspect. Um, so, I mean, it, ASIN investigations are just a part of life on Amazon. We have a listing closed pretty much perpetually at this point because we have so many different products. I mean, we're doing uh, something like six and a half million dollars on just Amazon this year. So, you know, by the time you get to this type of type of volume, something's always closed and something's always under investigation. We take them very seriously. Anytime something gets closed, we we do our best to try to make it better. So, my recommendation for this specific thing. Uh, we sell electronics that are more complex and harder to inspect. I think that's a little bit of a cop-out. I think that you have to figure out a way to inspect them better, whether it's uh, in the middle of production and there's like tests that happen along the way instead of just a final inspection or finding a different factory that can do better. Um, you know, if you think about something as complex as an iPhone that gets shipped out, their, their error rates are, are pretty damn low. So complexity shouldn't be something that would stop uh, stop that from happening and just figure out a way to, to, to fix the problem would be my recommendation for that. Okay. So is it any better? It is significantly better. We oh, think all we appreciate you uh, doing this because it was killing me. Uh, <laughs> it's like good content, but then like all you could focus on was how bad it sounded. So well, it's funny too. I was, me and Mike were talking before. I'm like, oh, Mike, you don't need to come on the webinar. You can, you take a break, buddy. I'll, I'll do this one. And if you were not here, I'm just, keep on talking for 60 minutes, look at the Q&A at the end and realize, and then realize nobody can understand a word I said. So maybe you can just get a couple uh, comments in the chat. Do you guys think it's better or? Let's see, much better, a lot better. All right. Perfect. Okay. And uh, Denise, if you can put that comment in the question, in the Q&A, because otherwise it'll scroll by and I'll lose it. All right, let's uh, re-kick it up. Sorry about that, All everybody. Right, now, hack number three, talking about getting better quality sound when you're doing a webinar. <laughs> okay, better quality products. And this kind of flows into the question that Mike just did here too, um, getting better quality products. Okay, so where a lot of people, I think, get a little bit confused with factories in China is that they think that a factory is making ev absolutely every component of a product. They're not. They're definitely buying some uh, percentage of those components from another factory themselves. And in fact, actually a lot of factories aren't even factories, they're assemblers. And if there's importers in this crowd right now, a good percentage of you are actually probably buying from an assembler. They're simply buying a bunch of different product or parts and components from different factories and then assembling them, sewing them together or putting them together and putting them in a nice pretty box and exporting them to you. So, the big key to avoid um, getting crappy quality products is to make sure that those parts and components are good quality themselves. Most products don't end up shitty because the whole product is shitty. They're doing, it ends up crappy because that supplier at some point along the supply chain, they've started 
buying inferior quality components from another factory. Now they can do this for two reasons. They can do it because they're just trying to cheap out. And that's normally the most frequent way that it happens is that they're trying to save uh, 50 cents on a zipper. Instead of buying a YKK zipper, they start to substitute it for a cheaper zipper. Uh, the other thing that can happen is that they could just simply be oblivious to it. And they're not even aware that they're buying uh, an inferior quality product from another factory. So what happens is that they'll, they'll change factories trying to save money. They think they're buying the same part, but they're not. So the first thing to do, you're importing a product from China. What you want to do is make a note of every single component that goes into that product that you're importing. So if it's a garlic press, make a note of the handle, um, make a note of the box, ask your supplier, what type of box did you use here? Is it a, is it a three layer box? Is it a five layer box? This plastic that goes into this garlic press, what type of plastic is this used? If it has a rubber grip, make a note of that rubber grip on basically a materials specifications sheet and include that with your PO. And you just want to document every single part that goes into the product that you're buying. Another thing you can do, and people don't realize this, you can actually ask your supplier for an invoice of where they bought that specific part from. Tell them that you just want to make sure that the supply chain is consistent and they don't change their suppliers and you want to see an invoice for where they actually bought those parts from. Uh, it just ensures that if they say that they're buying YKK zippers, that there actually is verifiable proof that they bought legitimate YKK zippers. So just include that with your PO every time. Okay, negotiating low MOQs. So when I'm buying products, I'm always trying to do them in five to 10 bunches. I'm not buying products, but launching products. I try to do them in five or 10 groups, just because you get a lot of economies of scale when you do it this way. So if I'm launching five or 10 products, I don't want to be spending five or 10 grand on an MOQ to test that product out. That would, that would be a hundred grand. What I want to do is I want to get a really cheap first order in, test it out, see if it can get traction, and then pick the winners, keep those and throw away the losers. So the key to getting low first orders is to, on your first order, don't order one sample. Most people do this. They order one sample, look it over, and what happens is, is a supplier sends them a perfect sample, and you look it over and you say, okay, well, that's pretty good, and then you order a thousand units of it. The problem is when you order one sample, you can't test sell that on Amazon at all. Uh, it doesn't show anything. Even if you did send that one unit in, if you sell one unit, that does not prove anything. Now, if you order a carton on your first order, a carton of you know 25 to 50 different units, you can actually test sell those on Amazon. And when you do that, if you sell out of 50 units in two days, you know, hey, this is probably going to be a successful product. I have no problem committing to a thousand units for that product. Now, why this works is that when you first make an order with a supplier, especially if you're dealing with an Alibaba supplier, they're going to be open to whatever you want to do. They're just happy to get any money from you at that point. Alibaba suppliers, especially 99.9% .9 of all the inquiries that they get never lead to a single dollar going into their bank account. So they're happy just to get $1 from you. Uh, and so if you ask them, Hey, don't send me one product, send me an entire carton of products. They're going to agree to it the vast majority of times. You can test that on Amazon and determine if it's going to be a hit product or not. Okay, so now you've got this great product. You negotiated pricing from your Chinese supplier. Uh, now you're actually going over to China to go see them, do the whole relationship building and Guangxi building with your supplier. Now, going to China is actually pretty cheap, but it still costs money. Here's hack number five. You can get your travel expenses paid for from Chinese trade shows. So in Asia, there are tons of trade shows. Go to chinaexhibition.com and you'll find a trade show for pretty much every weird industry that you can imagine, whether it's, uh, whether it's cotton candy vending uh, companies or boating companies. There's a trade show for absolutely everything. Now these trade shows, what they want to do is they want to really boost up their foreign attendance numbers. They want people like me and Mike and any other basically Westerner to visit their shows because then what they can do is they can uh, mark up the price of their booths that they sell to the actual suppliers. So a lot of trade shows in China have what they call a buyer sponsorship program. And you pre-register for these trade shows and you basically just show up with your registration uh, form. When you get to the trade show, you've go to this little uh, table and they'll actually give you cold, hard cash uh, just for showing up. 
Uh, give you a couple examples. Next month is Global Sources. They will give you $2,800 just for showing up to their show. Now you actually just missed the deadline for this. The deadline was about a week ago. Uh, but if you had pre-registered, they give you 28 Hong Kong dollars, which is, which is about 400 US dollars just for showing up. Uh, the Hong Kong mega show, which happens in October, they do the same thing. It ranges anywhere from two to three grand or two to three, two to three thousand Hong Kong dollars, which is about three to 400 US dollars. Most, I shouldn't say most, a good percentage of trade shows in Asia, China or Hong Kong will do this for you. They will give you cash just for pre-registering and showing up to their trade shows. So what you should do, go to chinaexhibition.com, find a trade show that you want, go to that website and look for a buyer sponsorship program. If, you, uh, if they have it available, pre-register. Okay, now you're actually visiting your supplier. If you know anything about kind of Chinese relationship building, you probably know that you should bring a gift. Now I am a king of giving shitty gifts, so I'm gonna give you some hacks over for not giving a really terrible gift. So suppliers basically want something authentic, especially if you're dealing with a sales agent. They want to know that you're gonna have something real, not some counterfeit item that is really common in China. They want to know that the vitamins that you give them aren't gonna kill them, uh, which will happen a lot of times with Chinese vitamins. Um, so they basically want to know that the items that you're giving them are going to be authentic. And they don't want some cheesy souvenir either. I mean, China is a quickly developing country. Uh, they want expensive gifts now, um, just <laughs> for better or worse. So if you're from New York, don't give an I love New York t-shirt. They want a coach handbag or a coach little wallet. Uh, you can go to a, go to the coach discount store, uh, the uh, outlet mall. You can get a nice little coach uh, bag like this for one for under a hundred bucks. It is mean the world of difference to your supplier. If you're from Vancouver, don't have a cheesy magnet, give a Lululemon uh, apparel item. Now those are all great. And if you're dealing with like a sales agent who typically is going to be a younger male or female, who's just going to be excited to have something to show off to their friends. These work great. Uh, even better than these items though, if you have WeChat and if you have Alipay, give a little red envelope. So when you're chatting with somebody on WeChat, you have this option to send them a red envelope. Uh, the catch is that you need to have Alipay. Now with the Chinese government, they tend to open up Alipay to foreigners uh, sometimes and then they'll close it off for other times of the year, uh, just with their financial regulations, that's the way it goes. If you have Alipay, every time around a nice uh, time of the year, whether it's Chinese New Year, you're really smart, you figure out your uh, sales rep's birthday, send them a 50 to $100 US, US dollars uh, red packet. It's gonna mean the world of a difference in them. All of a sudden, when you've realized, oh crap, I'm about to run out of stock on Amazon, I need to get another order in quickly and I need it to be done quickly, they're going to give you a lot more preferential treatment after they think back and remember that, oh yeah, Dave gave me a nice $50 red packet on Chinese New Year. Another final hack, if you're dealing with the owner or a master, you know, they have lots of money, they don't really, you know, they'll appreciate your red packets and it's a nice token of appreciation. Uh, same thing with a little coach handbag. Uh, but even better than that, they want something that they can contribute to their R&D department. Now, if you've been to China, you know that R&D means rip off and duplicate. So what they want is they want basically product samples that they cannot get in China. So they want a sample of that newest product um, that they can basically duplicate. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to endorse your product counterfeiting. Um, most suppliers actually in China won't agree to that anyways. But if it's like a non-patented product, they wanna see what the what their competitors are doing. What different things are they doing to produce a product? They actually want to see how to make a better mousetrap. Uh, the other thing you can do is bring a product catalog of a major retailer. They love this. They love to see what are American consumers buying because they can adjust their product, uh, their production according to it. If they see that uh, widget spinners are the big thing, they wanna see that. And, potentially adjust their production for that. Okay, customs and duties. Now, this hopefully is not gonna be as relevant in a few weeks from now. Hopefully there'll be a trade deal in the work, uh, or in the works, and hopefully it'll be done soon. Now, even with Trump's tariffs, most products are still exempt. Uh, it's about 50% of products are tariffed, 50% aren't. Uh, even if you are hit, about half of our products are, I know Mike, uh, a couple of your big products have been hit. Even if they are hit, it's still a pretty minor percentage. It's 10% from products. 
Um, if you sell something like a flashlight, it's probably a 3% hit to your margin. Yeah, that does and it probably means that you're drinking one last latte a day. It's not going to alter your business uh, all that dramatically, especially in the short run. You can probably weather the storm and not raise your prices. That's why I'm but drinking again, a homemade tea instead of a Starbucks right now. Well, I got uh, a instant coffee, so. <laughs> um, so yeah, they're probably not, they're at the end of the world, these tariffs, but hopefully a deal is in the works and probably later this month, something should be announced. Now, long-term though, we all hate duties because the major thing is that you have to pay for duties all at once. It's almost like GST up here in Canada. When you bring products into Canada, you have to pay 5% off the top in tax, uh, right up the top, and that's a huge cash flow hit. Now, there's a couple ways to not necessarily avoid this, but delay this. So when your products first come into America or Canada, what happens is they go into a bonded warehouse, and then that bonded warehouse, no duties are paid, uh, they're in bond. Once they're removed from that warehouse, then you pay your duties. Now this works well for a couple of reasons. Number one, if you have your own warehouse, you can actually make your own bonded section of your warehouse. To make a bonded warehouse where you don't have to pay any duties until they're removed, all you do is you take a can of spray paint and you basically spray paint a line down the middle of your warehouse. And you keep a logbook of everything that enters that bonded section of your warehouse and everything that enters it. And not, not actually just products, also people. You have to log every time somebody enters that section of the warehouse. And what happens is customs agents uh, can actually do a random inspection to make sure that everything that's supposed to be in that bonded section of your warehouse is there. Uh, but what you can do is you can order a lot of quantity of products at a time and every month or so remove a quantity of product from that bonded section of your warehouse and only pay duties on that section that you removed. The other thing that bonded warehouses work really well for is that you can move goods in transit between multiple countries. So in Vancouver, where I live, the port here is an absolute gong show. Uh, you bring products in here, they'll be inspected a quarter of the time. Uh, there'll be delays at the port. It's just a terrible mess. So what we do is we bring all our goods through the port of Seattle and ship them in bond up to Vancouver. And we avoid the basically seaport of Vancouver. So you can do this. We never pay any duties in America because they're being transferred in bond. The other thing you can do is something called duty drawbacks. So for us, we will ship a lot of products often into America. And then later down the road, we'll realize, oh crap, our inventory in Canada is getting low and we'll ship products that we've already paid duty on in America and we'll ship them up to Canada. What's happened is that we're going to be double duty. We're going to have to pay American duty Canadian duty. And you can actually file to get back those duties through what they call a duty drawback. Anything that's exported, you do not have to pay duty on. Now the paperwork is expensive. The good news is though you can do this on big shipments. If you re-export those to Canada or the UK, you can get those duties back. You can even actually do it on individual shipments. So if you one day sell the cell phone, you paid tax on it or duty on it when it went to America, but now you sell it to somebody in Japan, you can actually file to get back that duty that you paid originally when it came into America. Uh, the big downside is the paperwork can get a little bit expensive, but talk to your customs broker about this to make to see if it makes sense for you. Another easy hack, do never, never, never pay for your customs and duties with your credit card. Uh, you might not realize that they're charging you 3% every time you do that, the customs broker is. Uh, I know credit card points are nice, but you're probably not getting a 3% cash back. So don't pay for duties with your credit card if you can avoid it. Uh, if you have cash flow constraints and you need to, I get that. But if you have the cash, don't pay with credit card. Next thing, annual bond. So every time you bring something into America, you get charged a bond fee. Normally it's 50 to $100 per uh, shipment that you have coming into the country. That's fine if you're only doing a couple shipments. If you're doing more than a couple of shipments, you can get an annual bond. An annual bond will be $500 and it covers you for unlimited an unlimited amount of shipments going into the country. So just ask your customs broker for an annual bond. Normally they won't give this to you by default, even though they can see that you're ordering, you're doing dozens of shipments a year, they'll just forget to ask you. So if you're doing lots of shipments, get an annual bond, you'll save yourself uh, at least a few hundred dollars a year. Next thing, and the final thing here uh, on tariffs, every time your shipment comes into the country, it is According to the uh, Freedom of Information Act, publicly accessible information, people can go on to things like Import Genius and Pangeva and see exactly whatever's on your bill of lading. 
don't let your competitors do that and creep you to death and figure out your suppliers and what your order quantities are. Request vessel confidentiality from US Customs. All you do is you email this address that you see on your screen right here. Tell them, give them your business name and address and say that you want vessel confidentiality. Your information will not be revealed on services like Import Genius. Okay, a couple more here. Uh, hack number eight, now you've kind of, your products are ready to go. You're shipping them to America or Canada or wherever they're going. Uh, the first hack, if you're an Amazon seller, ship them directly to Amazon. You're going to save yourself a lot of money and a lot of time. So if you go to a 3PL and you, that's kind of your middleman, the pros and cons with 3PL, the pros are the storage costs are a lot less than Amazon. You can use Amazon partnered carriers and Amazon is shipping your shipment or dividing your shipment into multiple warehouses across the US, well, you it's okay because your 3PL can simply ship multiple different warehouses without a problem. Uh, the downside is the biggest one is it's more work every time you have to communicate with your 3PL. It's just, it is a huge time suck, uh, opposed to directly sending all your goods into Amazon and never having to think about it ever again. There's also higher bound and outbound costs. Your 3PLs are charging you container unloading fees, pick and pack fees, all these other fees that Amazon does not charge to receive your shipment. Yes, Amazon charges you on the outbound leg of it, but they do not charge you any fees on the inbound portion of it. And next, there's more handling of your products and this can be a really disastrous thing. So your goods, they're shipped in this next sealed container, to your 3PL, your 3PL unloads them. Oh, all of a sudden Joe drops the package as he's unloading that container. And then they put it in their 3PL and then UPS comes and picks up the items and then UPS guy drops another one of your items. And before you know it, 10% of your shipment has been damaged because of that additional handling. So it's great if you can ship a sealed container to Amazon, you avoid all of that additional handling uh, that you don't need. Direct Amazon, uh, basically the opposite of everything I talked about there. There's no receiving costs and there's smaller overland freight costs. The big negative though is that it requires shipping to one fulfillment center. I'm gonna get into this in a second. Uh, so that's probably why a lot of people don't ship directly to Amazon because they're dividing shipments into multiple warehouses. Now, here's the tricks in shipping into one fulfillment center. First off, if your items are standard size, they're probably only going to one fulfillment center. Amazon's really good with standard size items to only have them sent to one fulfillment center. If your items are oversized, then they're going to divide them into multiple fulfillment centers and there's really no good way to avoid that. Now, what you do want to avoid doing though, is if you have two SKUs from a supplier and you're going into a container, try to do everything you can to avoid having oversized and standard size items mixed into the same container. So we basically, we have an order schedule. Every three months, we do three containers. We do one oversized container, one standard size container, and then one container that we ship directly to Canada. Uh, you should try to do that too. Try to avoid ordering standard size items and oversized items in the same shipment. Now the other hack, if your items are all standard size, you want your items going to Ontario 8 in Southern California, basically Los Angeles. Now, if you put your delivery address, your ship from address as, uh, if you're in New York, as New York, well, they're probably gonna ship it, they're gonna try to be nice to you and have you ship it to a fulfillment center close to New York. And when you're shipping directly into Amazon, you're using your own carrier, they don't care what your ship from address is. You can put whatever you want in there. So the hack is, the, if you wanted to go to Ontario 8, Los Angeles, because that's the most direct route from China to America, you want to use a Southern California address. And just for uh, fun, you can put the Fresh Prince of Bel Air's address there, 251 North Bristol Avenue. Put that as your ship from address when you're creating your shipment on Amazon, and you're probably going to have that shipment designated to Ontario 8. Okay, this got cut off here, but hack number nine is uh, use an Amazon-only freight consolidator. Now, shipping directly to Amazon works really well if you're shipping full containers and going to one FC. Um, the problem is a lot of us are probably shipping LCL, which is less than a container. And LCL directly into Amazon doesn't work so well because they have to be palletized, they have to have all these nice pallet labels put on them. Um, it's just a pain. Now, 
the Chinese, though, Chinese sellers have gotten one step ahead of this. And uh, just so you know, in China, there are so many better services for Amazon sellers than we have in North America and in the West. They're so far ahead of the game, it's not even funny. Um, and one of those things that they have, one of these services that they have is an Amazon only freight consolidator. So what they do is they take all the shipments from multiple Amazon sellers and they ship these directly into Amazon in one container. So we have a shipment right now going from Qingdao, uh, which is a city in China, and it's only about three cubic meters and it's going directly into a warehouse basically in central Canada. And because it's an LCL, we can't ship this ourselves directly into China or into Amazon, at least not cost effectively. Now with these Amazon only freight consolidators, the big advantage is the cost. They charge you typically two to $300 per CBM. Now one CBM, basically on a pallet, it's one and a half CBM. So it's pretty cheap. So this shipment going into central Canada for us, I think cost was about six or $700. That's every cost from our supplier in China, all the way to Amazon, including custom brokerage, not duties, but customs brokerage. Um, so for, close to 600 bucks, just a little bit above that. There is not a freight forwarder that we talk to that can even come close to touching that price. Uh, because what they're gonna do is they're gonna tack on all these other administrative fees, invoicing fees, dock fees, all these other fees. And to work with any other freight forwarder, it's going to be close to double that. So the one that we use is a company called mclhk.net. They do have an English speaking staff member on there. What you do though, just have them contact your supplier in China. So you don't even have to worry about the language barriers to say, hey, if you're a Chinese supplier, this is our freight forwarder, can you talk, contact them? And all they'll want from you is basically what warehouse in, uh, what Amazon warehouse you're shipping it to. They'll ship to any of Amazon's dozens and dozens of different warehouses. And wrapping things up with just a few more random shipping tips for you guys. Uh, Mike talked about this before, use the de minimi uh, threshold to your advantage. So this is basically an $800 limit. Anything under $800, you do not have to pay duties on going into America. It is absolutely the most crazy thing uh, in policy that America has. Most countries are 20 to $50 for a de minimi limit. In America is $800 for whatever reason. Uh, use it to your advantage. You can uh, ship all day long under $800. You're not going to pay any duties. Uh, get your supplier to do all of your labeling. Do not have a 3 pl put pallet labels on because they're going to charge you probably 25 cents per label and you can get your supplier to do it for you for free. <clears throat> and always be pushing to get to a 20 foot full container. Now, if you're first ordering a product, you're first starting off, you're not going to order a 20 foot container most likely on your first order. Uh, but that is kind of like your maximum efficiency. Now a 40 foot container is actually your maximum efficiency. Uh, but the price difference between a 20 foot and a 40 foot container isn't that high. Uh, but try to be getting to a full container load for uh, your shipments from a supplier. Try to avoid LCL and air shipments because you're paying through your teeth for freight costs. And if you can't ship a 20 foot uh, full container, which a 20 foot full container is roughly 30 cubic meters, even if you can't quite get there, but you're close, Anything over 15 cubic meters is actually going to be better for you most likely to ship in a full container and actually basically ship the container uh, three or one quarter empty or one third empty. Um, so you don't actually have to fill up that whole container. Sometimes it does make sense to ship empty air. And the final hack, uh, hack number 11, join Ecom Crew Premium. So uh, we talked about this in the beginning. Ecom Crew Premium is open right now uh, only for a week only. So we do have a few premium members actually in the audience right now. Hopefully they would all agree that it's a pretty good investment for your company. The big thing that we try to do in Ecom Crew Premium that separates us from uh, some of the other things that are out there is basically unlimited support that Mike and I both give. Um, and actually we have, a, fairly significant team with Ecom Crew now. Um, so we have designers on staff, uh, we have Mike and myself, and we have other experts too that can uh, basically help you with anything that you need in your e-commerce uh, e business. So we give 24-7 uh, unlimited email support. So any questions that you have, whether it's about finding a product, uh, getting your shipments from China, uh, figuring out different shipping costs, uh, getting a review of your Amazon listing page, all those types of things you get included with your Ecom Crew Premium membership. Um, 
and yeah, it's uh, it works out to just over a hundred bucks a month. And I think a lot of people who are here in the audience right now would agree that it's a pretty good investment for you to make. So beginning of the year, if you're hoping to get to seven figures and beyond this year, uh, definitely check it out. Econcrew.com slash premium. Um, like I mentioned, here's all the things that you get. Also, like mentioned, we have our mastermind going on April 26th. So if you can go there, if you can make it, please do. If you're a non-premium member, you can join it. It's going to be $499. Uh, if you're a premium member, you get uh, your ticket for a hundred bucks and that basically covers the cost of your seat and of lunch that you get. So for premium members, we're not really making any money at all off you guys. It's basically part of your membership, but uh, we're charging you for your lunch. <laughs> it's expensive in Hong Kong. It is. Uh, a skill, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, is asking, does it make sense for future entrepreneurs to join or does it make more sense after being established? I, I think both, honestly, I'm, it's not really just a sales pitch, but um, you know, if you're just getting started, you have lots of questions and after you get started, you have lots of questions and the biggest part of premium is that we help answer questions. Uh, there's also a course in there about uh, how to pick pick products and niches and how to develop a seven figure brand. That's all very beginner type stuff. And there's also more advanced stuff in there, like uh, the Facebook messenger course and also the email marketing course that we're going to be coming out with uh, uh, in about six weeks or so, maybe four weeks. And, and that's a little bit more advanced, but so there's a little bit of stuff in there for everybody. Um, you know, our goal was to, to make seven figure entrepreneurs out of what we do with Ecom Crew premium. So I think that uh, the answer is both. One thing I forgot to mention too, and this goes for the premium members in the webinar right now, um, our seven figure building a seven figure brand course actually just relaunched um, uh, last week or not relaunched, but we basically updated the entire course. Uh, we did a bunch of recording a couple months ago when we were in New Orleans, uh, updated a lot of the content, uh, especially talking about some things that are more relevant today than it, than that were necessarily when we first recorded it about two years ago, uh, talking about things about uh, basically protecting your brand on Amazon, which is a big one, always making sure that people aren't ripping off your brand, defending your brand on Amazon. Um, Cause once you build this nice, great brand that's doing well, uh, you don't want people ripping you off. So we address a lot of those things in the new and improved updated seven, uh, building a seven figure brand course. So if you're a premium member, check it out now. It should be updated in your uh, dashboard. And if you're new to premium, uh, you'll get access to that when you do join. All right, so we are going to spend uh, the next half hour or so, whatever it takes to get through the Q&A. So if you have questions about any of the stuff that they've talked about or I guess anything in general with e-commerce, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Again, please don't use the chat box for questions. It's easier for us to keep track of them in the Q&A. So the first one that was here was Dan was asking, uh, will you cover how to ship directly uh, to Amazon from out of the country? We did cover that. If you have any more questions about that, feel free to type that in another question. Uh, uh, e. Howard is asking, how can I find a manufacturer for a small order of custom apparel? Um, I would check out globalsources.com uh, for that. Uh, they have a, and they have a big fashion show coming up. It's at the same time as Global Sources Summit. Uh, so the manufacturers that are there can probably do small run stuff for you. Uh, if not, I would just look to like the LA fashion district. I mean, there's lots of uh, companies in the U S that will do just small run type stuff, depending on how, uh, how small run you're looking to do here. Um, Blake, oops. Blake was asking another question here. I'm interested in how I can value, how can I value add a product like decorative flags? And he has an example here, but I can't click the link. Um, that's a tough one, man. That's a, that's a tough one to do value add for. We, um, in our previous company, anchoring.com, we looked into flags quite extensively. Wow. When I close that door, it just echo gets crazy. So let me just open it. Uh, we looked into flags quite extensively. Uh, they are very hard to differentiate aside from doing something like, uh, bundling them together. It's a tricky one because flags are normally, uh, Canadian flag, you can't do anything to change that. An American flag, you can't add more stars onto it and advertise it as 53 stars. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a tricky thing, unless you're doing uh, something that's kind of current with uh, whatever is like trendy at the time. In terms of actually like differentiating a flag, it's really hard because you can't change the flag and then 
if you do anything different to the fabric or the stitching or anything like that, it's not very demonstrable in a photo. And that's one of the things I hate about fabrics is that fabric changes and that type of thing, it's never demonstrable. So it's a tricky one. I mean, not every product is great to spend your time and money on and flags is probably one I would stay clear of. Yeah, me too. Uh, Andrea says, what is the base of any negotiation on price, shipping or defect compensation? I guess it depends what you're, I mean, they're both negotiation points. Um, I mean, the defect compensation, again, you have to, if we get one or two defects on an order of a thousand, we're not going to bug them for compensation for it normally. Um, we log everything and, you know, if it's going to move the needle one way or the other, that's when we do start asking to get compensated for it. Um, so shipping is normally the first point of negotiation because that's just a static that's never going to change. So that's the first thing I would try to negotiate. And then with the defects, that's kind of more variable from order to order. So the shipping is the one that I would try to negotiate uh, basically every order. Okay. Uh, Tony's asking, what's the best email address to reach you guys at? Do you read all the messages that come into the support box? Uh, if you're not a premium member, the best way to get us is support at ecomcrew.com. If you do join ecomcrew premium, uh, Dave and I uh, manage the, the members only box. So we have a, a members only, like a Hecom Crew Premium members only inbox. And Dave and I are the ones that uh, monitor all that and support at Ecom Crew is managed by our uh, Philippine staff. And if there's something in there that they need to ask us about, they do, but they do a pretty good job of fielding all that stuff. It's mostly uh, people trying to sponsor the podcast and stuff like that that comes in. It's a bunch of annoying things that we don't want to deal with. So uh, but if you have a question, feel free to, to send it in there and, and they will definitely get back to you or ask us and we'll get back to you. Uh, Denise is saying, I mentioned that the tax, that, that the minimus tax was higher than 800. Did that change or is it still 800? No, it's 800. So $2,500 is for a formal customs entry. And so anything under $2,500, you don't have to have what they call a formal customs entry. Basically, you don't need an importer of record of that type of thing. You do in between $800 and $2,500 still have to pay duty, but you don't need a formal customs entry. And it's, it's, not, it's not a big win uh, not having to do a formal customs entry. It's not like the $800 de minimis where you avoid both a formal customs entry and paying duty. So $800, the $800 threshold, that's really the magic number. Got it. Uh, Blake was asking back on question one again, how much should a 97 kilo shipment cost and what's the cheapest way by air to ship it? Um, so these freight prices change actually pretty dramatically throughout the year, uh, the based, on, based on supply and demand. There is two ways to do it. You can do uh, air freight, which is cheaper. Um, it takes a couple of days longer, not too much longer. Um, and that's the way I would do it. I think last, last check it was between five and seven dollars, but I can't remember if that was per pound or per kilo. Per kilo, normally. Per kilo. Okay. Yeah. So uh, between five and seven bucks per kilo. Uh, it is definitely more expensive, obviously, than shipping uh, in a container, but you get it way quicker. And if it's just something as small as 97 kilos, it actually ends up being cheaper typically just shipping it by air freight. The other thing too, Blake, if you're going directly into Amazon, and I uh, know your business, you might not be uh, going directly into Amazon, but uh, that service I mentioned about Amazon Freight Consolidation, MLKHC.net, um, they also have really good rates going on air freight uh, into Amazon warehouses. And Blake, you're a Ecom Crew Premium member. We have like a special contact for really cheap shipping. If you email us at the member's address, I can get you our freight 40. He's been saving a bunch of people a lot of money. We try to keep them just for members because he gets, he can get overwhelmed. We try to keep it from getting out of control. Um, John says, great advice on getting a lower MOQ. You're welcome. From Dave. Thank you. Uh, anonymous uh, says, if test selling 25 to 50 units on Amazon, if they're sold out in the first couple of weeks and you don't have inventory in fulfillment centers, uh, what do you do about listing about that listing until the next shipment comes in? 
So we, we're bad. Normally nine times out of 10, we just leave it just because Amazon doesn't seem to be nearly as punitive as it used to be. And I mean, you can close the listing technically. I, for us, because we're not targeting the most competitive products, our inventories, they don't tend to take this huge hit where if, when they run out of stock. So for the most part, we don't really have to do a whole lot to them to avoid any like punitive <laughs> repercussions from, uh, from Amazon. Uh, there is, Mike might have the article, but there's been some uh, studies too that basically show raising the price and basically trying to suck out the length of time until it runs out of stock is not the best thing to do. You want to keep the price, it's better to actually run out of stock quickly at your current price than just up the price to some absurd amount and uh, just wait for it to slowly run out of stock. So you better just actually let it run out of stock than track your price up and try to extend it forever. Yep. Uh, Nicole says for the low MOQ, would you send that one car in directly to Amazon or would you send it to yourself, check it and then send it to Amazon? I would definitely send it to me first. I mean, if it's the initial listing and stuff, you're also going to want to probably take some uh, photos and things of, like that nature too, uh, of it and shipping one box of stuff in the Amazon's like $4, but the UPS, it's ridiculously cheap. Um, so I would definitely send it to myself first. Uh, John Lee says, how do I know who to bring gifts to, i.e. the account rep, owners, managers, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, th this one's tough. Like it's hard to know uh, who to always bring it to. I usually bring it to my contact. So it's usually whoever is the person I'm the, working with the most. Uh, is the one that I bring it to. And that ranges from depending on the size of the factory to the actual owner, to, uh, to a rep. And if I have a real, if I do have a relationship with the owner and a rep, there's a couple of situations like that. I try to bring uh, both of them something. Uh, one thing that Dave didn't mention that I like to bring is alcohol, like some you know, small batch alcohol type stuff from, from the U S seems to always be received well. Um, but it, um, you know, my biggest challenge now uh, for me is that I, uh, I travel very minimalist. So I, I only bring a backpack for like a three week trip and bringing gifts is like, just don't fit. So it's becoming a bigger challenge for me. I was going to say, you have lots of alcohol that you can give away now, Mike. <laughs> well, I'm not going to uh, not, not drink forever. It's just been, just been a little while. You're going to let it age. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It'll be better later. Uh, John says, I just ordered my first samples from a new supplier. When should I plan my first trip to China to visit my supplier? before the first major bulk purchase or after one or two purchases. Um, you know, this is just more, what's your budget? What, what's your, you know, long-term plan in life and business? Uh, you can probably get away with never going realistically. Like you don't have to go. Like for me, uh, I go a couple of times a year because I think that relationships are super important. Uh, I find that by going, uh, it's made a huge difference in our business, but you know, we were already, a million dollar plus business, I think, uh, before we made our first trip over there. So uh, it's not cheap and you're taking away time from other things when you go. So, you know, I would look at what's your, your long-term outlook on, on this and what do you, you, you know, have you already quit your job? Is this like, are you all in? Uh, are you looking to make a, you know, a $10 million business as quick as you can? Or is this like a lifestyle thing and uh, et cetera. So like, you know, I think that both, both things are perfectly acceptable. Uh, Blake's asking, how much does a bonded warehouse cost and how much does it save you? I'll let you answer that one, Dave, because I don't really know. They're, ac they're free to operate. The, um, the big cost is the actual paperwork. Every time you basically bring products out of that bonded warehouse, you have to do a customs uh, clearance for it. So that's where the real cost is. Um, that's where it gets expensive. In terms of actually running it though, it's just, there's no cost to it. It's a log, it's a log book that you keep, you record everything that goes in and everyone that goes in and out of that warehouse. And that's all there is to it. Uh, Mark says, I was able to get an annual bond for $245 covering $50,000 of taxes and duties. I presume the $500 quote is for a larger amount. Uh, I can remember back to the first time we ever got a bond, it was for 500 bucks, but we also in our first year paid more than $50,000 in taxes and duties. So there might be a, a lower amount. Um, there's also, you can pay on a per shipment basis, uh, which is like 50 bucks or something like that, uh, and, and not actually get uh, an annual bond. 
it's not a fixed cost. It's, it's like a jail bond in the U S um, you can shop it around. You can get lower prices. $500 is normally the markup that a customs broker will give you. Uh, you can actually buy it on your own and then give the paperwork to your customs broker. So if you're paying 250, that's probably just simply a better rate. There's um, not necessarily anything different between that and a $500 bond that you'll get through your customs broker. Yep. Uh, Mike's asking, do I have to request the vessel confidentiality on every shipment or is it annual or one time? Uh, so it's, it's a one time thing that's good for, it's more than a year, but I, it's less than five. So it's either between like three and five years. You might know that off the top of your head, Dave. Uh, I don't actually. They'll, they'll respond to you and tell you in the email, like how long that's good for. And I just put a reminder on my calendar. Uh, one really important thing uh, I actually sent in a few different variations because sometimes like they'll put our uh, yes. business with the comma or with the LLC or whatever. And I try to cover all my bases. It's an exact perfect match. Um, and I try to get my manufacturer to make sure that they're, they're doing it by the way that I sent that into the confidentiality. Uh, John Lee, if I'm having my supplier ship DDP directly to me or to me directly, can I use an annual bond or is it only applicable if I use a freight forward or a customs broker? Um, so you can use the annual bond, anything that you're bringing in that's under your company name. Uh, Blake, what's the volume or weight for a full container load? Uh, so I think that a uh, 20 foot container is 28 CBM, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah. That's the number that rings in my head. And it's double that for a 40 and it's about 62 or 64 CBM for a 40 foot HQ. Um, there is a weight limit on, uh, I forgot that number, but we have hit it before. It has to be pretty damn heavy stuff, but we have, we have heavy products that, uh, that we did hit that weight limit, but it's I have no idea how you hit that. We imported it's, boat it's anchors actually, and never hit it. Really? That's amazing. Well, the thing with boat anchors, though, you can't take really up a lot of air, it. though. Yeah, they take yeah. Up, like it's actually this product right here that caused the problem. <laughs> it's like this big, heavy clay pack. I mean, yeah. this little thing here weighs four pounds, I and mean, you start putting those in a, a container, and it, it hit the weight limit. It, it didn't hit it on a twenty foot because a twenty foot weight limit's basically the same as a forty foot weight limit. Uh, the way that it was explained to me is that the weight problem is actually the crane. Yeah. Uh, the crane can only lift so much, um, so it's basically the same for a twenty or a forty very close to it. It's not quite that, but uh, can you share the Amazon only freight forwarder URL again? Yeah, Dave, we'll put that in the chat right now for you. We'll also email out um, the slides to everybody tomorrow. So I'll put this in the chat box, but tomorrow you'll get it too. Blake is the, uh, the one Ecom crew premium member that came to our, uh, our rescue here and says it's a great deal. Get it today. <laughs> Thanks Blake. Blake, also let it, remind us of your address to send that gift to. Right. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Askeel uh, says, does it make, uh, so this chat thing is so dumb. Like if someone else types in another question, it like moves while I know, I'm like, I know. Typing, like we're trying to read the damn thing. Uh, does it make sense for future entrepreneur? Oh, wait, you already asked this. That's weird. Join right away. <laughs> it's for everybody. Best value ever. Uh, okay. Uh, Roger says, any advice on how to keep from getting copied or knocked off and sold directly on Amazon as a competitor, maybe in terms of agreements with vendors? Uh, we do cover this, as Dave mentioned, in depth in our new uh, updated uh, premium course, but just some quick tips. Uh, anything you can add with intellectual property makes a big difference. Uh, for instance, with our color gel pens, we made unique, new, new and unique color names for every single pen and printed them on there and filed for a copyright. Uh, that certainly helps. Having an agreement with the manufacturer does help, but that only helps in terms of getting that exact manufacturer not to copy them again. And even still, uh, we had uh, that happen before. And then what we did was we had to sue. Uh, unfortunately, it was the first time I ever had to sue somebody, um, but we, they, they wouldn't, the cease and desist letters they were ignoring and they were just like, uh, you know, going to keep, keep on going. So we had to sue them to keep, to keep Amazon from selling the product. Um, but those are a couple ideas that you can use. And uh, again, there's a whole module on this now in the new course. Um, okay. I mean, I'm going to butcher this name. Axel Aloch. Oh, oh no, no. 
Kalik ran that. Kalik, yeah. Uh, I'm looking to find product ideas. Do you suggest attending the Canton Fair this year? Um, yeah, I, I don't think the Canton Fair is a good, a good place for product ideas. Um, I think you should have your idea before you get there. Uh, personally, I, I can speak from experience with this. I, I went there just kind of aimlessly wandering the fair the first year that I went. And, uh, you, you know, it just, it's overwhelming. And if you don't have a plan, it's, it's very difficult. But if you go there uh, wanting to make, you know, this, this ice pack I just held up, for instance, I, I know I want to make this thing that I know that I need to go to the, uh, you know, the healthcare phase of the, of the show, which is, I can't remember if that's two or three. And I think it's in three and, uh, and walk that part of it. And, and so I have a very focused uh, objective when I'm there and I know exactly what I'm looking for. And, you know, I'm obviously seeing other things while I'm there up and down the aisles coming up with ideas, but uh, very difficult to, to just walk around looking for ideas. Um, I just have to move rooms here, so I will be back in probably a couple questions. Okay. Uh, Chris is asking, what's the best way to execute payment? Um, we send wire transfers for everything at this point. Um, and that's, you know, once you kind of get over just a couple thousand dollar threshold, that's really the only way that China will operate. Uh, we use American Express financial payments to do it, so we can send international wires without having to go to the bank. Uh, in any currency. Um, there's other services out there that do the same thing. Uh, okay, Kevin says, if you ship pallets to Amazon from your warehouse in China, will they know the factory it shipped from? Uh, should I be concerned that my, they may steal my product or supplier? If you ship pallets to Amazon from your warehouse in China. So I assume you mean from the manufacturer? Oh, you mean from the warehouse? Oh, okay. From another warehouse. Um, yeah. So they would know the fact. So if you have like a, a, a like that, the other consolidating company that you're talking about that, that yes, they would definitely know where it came from. Um, I wouldn't be concerned with them necessarily stealing your product and supplier. I mean, the company is doing this for hundreds, if not thousands of different companies and uh, things are definitely a little bit squirrely in China, but like, you know, at some point you gotta, you gotta trust the company you're working with. Um, let's see here. Uh, Skill had another question. Uh, when we, when do we file for a federal trademark before even starting to sell or after establishing a brand? Uh, my recommendation is to do it as early as humanly possible. Um, it takes like nine to 12 months to get the freaking trademark. Uh, so you, you want to do it as soon as you possibly can. Typically for us, we're, as soon as we have like a budding idea, a new brand that we want to create, uh, we know we're going to go all in on something. If we're going to start selling something, we, if we're testing something, it's individual products. It's not the niche or the brand. We know we're going to like create color. For instance, we start filing a trademark immediately and start working on products. Uh, we're going all in for it. Same thing with, our, with Wah Baby. Um, get the trademark as soon as you can. Uh, where can I get a list of suppliers for baby products? Uh, Hal is asking. Uh, in China, I mean, you can do go to the Canton Fair website uh, or Global Sources, and you can search there. Uh, but the directories are pretty poor. Um, we also have a module on uh, any income crew premium that talks about how to how to specifically how to find manufacturers. Uh, it covers a little bit more depth in there, but those are two good places to start. Um, Kevin says, I'm a big fan of both you guys and appreciate all your advice. I'm planning to visit my supplier to manage the QC for an upcoming order. This factory is in southwestern Shandong. Uh, have either of you ever been to this area? Know if it's safe? Any quick tips or advice? I've never been to China before. Um, Shandong is my stomping grounds. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I'm there at least a few days a year. Uh, so southwest Shandong is probably Qingdao or Jinan. Do you know the exact city, Kevin? If it's Qingdao, Qingdao is one of the nicest cities in China. Um, so, I mean, all of China is safe. Uh, and Shandong, there's some really beautiful parts there. So if you're in Qingdao, you're in for a treat too, because that's like the beer capital of China. Um, I wouldn't worry about safety in China. Like there, there's never been a time where I would have been worried about safety. Uh, getting around is a little bit difficult just because all the signs are in Chinese characters and it's hard to read anything. There's very few things in English anywhere. Um, that becomes a little bit of a challenge, but 
definitely not insurmountable. Uh, depends on your travel style. I mean, I've been like all over the world, um, like 49 countries now and just kind of figure things out when I get there. And if I'm kind of stuck or lost in a really big bind, usually there are people around that will help you. Um, but China is probably the most, if not one of the most difficult countries that I've traveled in and, and just mostly because the, the language barrier and the character barrier. Um, you know, like you look at your phone for something and it's like everything's in characters. You're trying to match characters up on the signs versus like if something's in French, at least the letters are the same. And, you know, somewhere in Paris, I can figure my way around easier. Here's a pro tip that I should have had in there. Um, so the Google Translate app, they actually have a real, I don't know how to describe it. Basically, you hold your camera up to the characters and it will translate it real time into English. I would uh, explain it as like back to the future. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, holy crap. It is actually really damn neat. And they just came out with that uh, about a year ago or maybe a year and a half ago. So it's like on the fly, like Dave said, you just like hold the phone up on any characters and instantly it's like, it's there in English. Um, pretty crazy, actually. Um, make sure you're holding the phone stable on your hoverboard. Yeah. And you also need to make sure you download that before you come because it's a pretty big app. Uh, as Dave Kuya would say, it's a heavy app. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, it's a pretty big plus you get like 5k a minute download speeds in china exactly uh nalita is asking will there be a replay available absolutely we'll be emailing that out in the next couple of days it takes a little while for this to to process um howard says thank you for the suggestions you're welcome my friend uh kurt i had tech issues is it possible to get a copy of the slide show deck yes that will all be emailed out uh, to people who are on uh, registered for the webinar. Uh, Nicole, uh, would you guys recommend staying away from trading companies? If so why? Uh, I definitely would not say that at all. I, I used to be more against trading companies because, you know, my desire to always want to feel like I'm getting the best price. And if there's a trading company in between me and the factory, I feel like they're taking margin away from me. But what I've realized is that uh, the trading company actually ends up getting me such a better price that uh, that I'm doing better with them, even by paying them their fee. Uh, so I'm basically, we've been using a, a sourcing agent who uh, is someone that we recommend to our premium members. The guy's amazing. Uh, he's also going to be at the mastermind. If you guys are coming to the mastermind in Hong Kong, he'll be there. You can talk to him there, but uh, he saved us uh, so much money on just one product that, uh, that we're getting a hundred thousand dollar extra valuation in our business. We're in the process of selling one of our businesses right now. Uh, and that alone uh, added over six figures that one product, uh, one thing sourcing it better. So um, I'm, I'm a fan of sourcing agents now. Just find a good one or join premium and we'll give you our contact. Uh, Andrea says, how do you avoid being out of stock on Amazon when your first uh, when you order a first sample batch. So, I mean, you're going to run out, like you don't avoid it. Um, that, that's inevitable when you're ordering samples. Uh, okay. Uh, will we get a replay? Yes. Sorry, I know you couldn't hear the beginning. Well, it's probably gonna sound that way uh, in the recording too though, because it was Dave's microphone. Uh, I'm going from, uh, Ted, uh, says I'm going from eight to 10 smaller orders over five months to one or two orders, uh, larger orders, uh, earlier in the year, any advice on price negotiation, uh, terms, uh, even if it's only money back until delivery, uh, how to approach them about not sending all the money for uh, each order up front as I have done in the past. So biggest thing you can do, Ted show them on paper your order quantities and how they've grown and what your exact plans are for next year. Just do it in numbers. Don't do it in English. Like show them, look, 2016, we did 10 grand. 2017, we did 20 grand. This year we're projected for 200 grand. Put it in numbers for them. Once you put it in numbers, they can't, they can only push back so hard because you've shown them objectively what your growth is and what you're planning to do. And I get it that you're kind of consolidating those now into one or two orders. And maybe you're, uh, maybe the order volume is overall the same for the year, but it still looks good though. If you show them what your orders are going to be, 
um, on an individual basis and how they've grown. And plus, they get, they'll get money savings too in like their export fees by doing a smaller amount of shipments. So there is going to be something in it for them. So just show it, put it to them in numbers exactly what you're trying to do. And when you do that, it'll just be a lot harder, harder for them to fight back uh, with you on. And in terms of getting terms, the best way to do it is fly over to China and then ask them right there and then. Because once you do that, then you're going to have uh, much, a much higher rapport with them. And it's going to be a lot better than if you do it through email. If you can't get over to China, then do it through WeChat. Uh, try to avoid doing it through email though. Um, just even WeChat's more personal, at least you're doing real time texting. Uh, Mark's asking if the consolidator is Millennium Logistics. Yes, it looks like I kind of clicked through that link and that's the name of the company. Uh, Askeel asked again about the federal, I think that just happened. That's weird. Some of these questions are coming through twice. Sorry about that. Uh, Michelle, I was out, uh, so I was in and out of the webinar. Did you guys talk about any other mastermind groups? I would love to be part of the Hong Kong group, but I don't currently sell on Amazon yet. Thinking might, uh, think it might move me towards selling faster, but if you're forming other groups, how far out are you from getting those groups together? So, well, uh, a premium member too, isn't she? Oh, is she? Yeah, that name does. Why something. do I know your name? I don't know if you're still here, Michelle. I don't know if you're a premium member still. I mean, it's only a hundred bucks to, to come if you're a premium member. Uh, we had a few people last year that uh, had not sold anything yet online that were that were there in the mastermind. I think it's actually adds a pretty interesting dynamic to the to the room. Um, the idea is to get advice from the group on whatever questions you have. So if your struggle is getting started, you could get advice from you know, several people in the room that are already selling. Most of the people in the room actually are already selling in the mastermind. So that's kind of the whole idea of the mastermind is to get uh, tips and tricks from everybody and everyone helps them each other. Uh, you build friendships and form other things that, that happen way past the mastermind. Uh, we have, a whole bunch of people that were in the mastermind last year coming back again. So it was, it seemed like people really enjoyed it. Yeah. Michelle is a premium member. Now I see your website. I, <laughs> I always associate websites more than names. Yeah. Um, so Michelle has a pretty uh, substantial off Amazon business. So congrats. Um, so definitely, especially for you too, because uh, you're not necessarily a new seller. You're just, uh, you don't sell on Amazon right now. Um, so last year, definitely we had uh, quite a few people not on Amazon, just, by decision and choice. So yeah, you wouldn't be out of place at all there. And if, you, uh, and if you're thinking of something non-Asian, um, because we mentioned in the Facebook group that we're gonna try to be doing uh, basically private monthly masterminds for people with a moderator, we're probably, A, you should keep bugging Mike and I about that and we'll <laughs> <laughs> crack the whip on us. But I think we're looking at probably the late spring to get this organized. We do it, the problem with masterminds is that if they fall apart really quickly if uh, there's not somebody there basically keeping them together. So if we're gonna do it, we wanna make sure that the mastermind doesn't fall apart in two or three months like a lot of masterminds do because once you have a mastermind that does work, and actually me and Mike, that's how we became partners with Econ Proofs through our mastermind. Uh, when they do work, they work incredible. So it's not something we wanna rush, but it's definitely either spring or summer that we will get our first mastermind going. Um, Mark is asking when you request shipping quotes, should you request X works or DDP? Um, I'm actually not even familiar with DDP as I'm familiar with FOB. Do you need delivered paid? So basically it, um, they ship it to wherever you are and they pay all the duty and everything. It's not um, that common no. except for an no. air shipments. Um, your best term is actually FOB. Uh, again, it's all, it really comes down to money. There's some liability things with different shipping terms, but really at the end of the day, it comes down to money. And so if you're being quoted X works or DDP, normally there's going to be whatever that shipping price is, that's going to be the difference in price. So it doesn't really make a huge difference. I mean, we try to do everything FOB. It's just easier. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's just a money thing. And um, there's really not that much of a difference one way or the other. Uh, Colin's asking, is the $800 limit on the uh, duty thing also include the cost of transportation or is it just the cost of the goods? Uh, it is just the cost of the goods. Uh, I think we already answered this question about what does the bonded warehouse save you? 
saves you nothing because you're you ultimately have to pay the duties. What it does is right. delays when you pay the duties. It's a cash flow issue, and you know there's a cost to money, so it, it saves you from that. Uh, Mark posted in here the CBMs per container. I was right; it is 28 CBM for a 20 foot, uh, and he says that it's 56 for a 40 foot. 45s never get shipped. It's always uh, 40 HQ would be the other one. Uh, e says, do you run marketing campaigns for test spellings? If you do, what campaigns? I don't know what you mean by that, honestly. Maybe you can add some clarification if you're still here. Hopefully you're still here. Uh, just add some clarification for that. Uh, but we don't run campaigns for typos, if that's what you're asking. Um, I'm not sure what you're asking there, honestly. And if we ever had a spelling test, Mike would fail nine times. Oh, it's test. embarrassing. It really is. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I'm bugging you. Well, I mean, it's true. Um, Yolanda, now that is a premium member. Uh, I have a quote for label and shipping to Amazon warehouse service to Ontario eight for the following. <laughs> nothing gets There's nothing right off. Oh wait, no, no, it's, like, it's down below that. Okay. So, oh, oh, it's uh, kind of weird how this Q and A is working today. It's, it's uh, all so over the place. For label and shipping to Amazon, pallet in and out ten dollars. Palletize nineteen dollars. Label fifty cents a label. That's definitely high. Uh, hmm. This seems a bit high. I'll uh, copy and paste what you wrote there, just so ah, it doesn't let you copy and paste. So weird why it does that. Send, send this into uh, the member's uh, email, Yolanda, and I'll hook you up with someone that can that can help with this and get you a different quote. Yeah, it's yeah, it's definitely on the higher side. I mean, it's not going to break the bank. You're, it's probably double what you can get if you shop it around, which it's a lot, but talking hundreds of dollars, not thousands. Um, Blake was just talking about the French Professor Bel Air. That's funny. Uh, Yi says to an Amazon fulfillment center, to <laughs> do you ask suppliers to quit FOB or the other term? Um, it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you're depending on your shipping company. I mean, we've actually used both XWorks and FOB. Uh, that's regardless if we're sending it to Amazon directly or to a third party fulfillment company in the US. Uh, so the freight forwarder, it doesn't make any difference, like where they drop it off at. Um, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, Nicole says, as a Canadian resident, would you recommend sending up an LLC in the United States in order to simplify the import process? So as a Canadian, no, do not do that. Um, you don't, it doesn't simplify anything. So you can get basically what they call a non-resident importer ID. So you do not need a U.S. company at all, and it's going to complicate your life probably more than it's going to help. So that would be the first thing I do is just a uh, customs worker will set it up for you. It's a non-resident importer ID. You can also even get an EIN without actually having a U.S. company. So that would be the last thing I would do is get a is to actually get an actual physical U.S. company. So just like I mentioned, the non-resident importer ID or uh, an EIN, just get an EIN without the company. Uh, Kevin says it's in Hens, China. I'm not even sure what that was in regards to now. Yeah, that's in the Shandong. Uh, that was about the Shandong. Oh, oh right, right, so, right, right. Uh, it's going to be completely safe, but you are going to stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> <laughs> that's a smaller city. And it's going to be a lot of fun. You're going to get there. And I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a smaller, it's 8 million people, but it's not like a regular uh, foreigner hub. So, yeah, it, it's, in terms of safety, it's completely fine. It's just, um, there's not going to be all your Western favorites there like you would expect in a major, more foreigner friendly hub in China, like Qingdao, where you can find like a McDonald's and a Starbucks in every block. So in terms of safety, no problem. In terms of travel comfort, maybe a little bit below average. Uh, Tony was asking, is there a way to take a screenshot on Zoom uh, on a Mac? It would be command shift three. I'm not sure what it is on Windows anymore. It's been a long time since I've done Windows. Control, print screen. Control, print screen. 
Uh, Nicole says, uh, will I be able to have the same ASIN or FN SKU for my Canada and uh, so Amazon Canada and Amazon.com listings uh, so I don't have to do different labels for the same product? Um, I know we, Dave, Dave, do you know the answer to this? We, Sorry, I, have I was to, looking at I, pictures I, of Heze China. <laughs> I have to ask uh, Jacqueline because like, she was the one that actually ended up ultimately figuring this out, but I believe we were able to finally figure out a way to uh, use the same FN SKU both in Canada and the US. But So they're totally changing things right now on Amazon. So they're, what are they? Like their ultimate goal is they're switching it all into something basically called, I think it's like seller hub or something. Yep. Kind of conglomerating vendor central and seller central. And so what I've been noticing happening is like the Amazon, wherever you create the listing first, they're carrying the ASIN over to the other marketplace. And now they're actually carrying over the product descriptions and the photographs and everything. So when you change it in one marketplace, then they're changing it everywhere. The FN SKU, I believe, yeah, you can, yeah, you can have that um, for the same ASIN across marketplaces. That's not an issue. Um, but not across, like not between the US and UK though, but it worked between US yeah, and not the UK, but yeah, because Amazon.ca and .com are what they call the uh, unified North American network. So yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. Again, uh, just be careful because they are changing everything right now and they're actually trying to make it more consistent though. So I don't think it'll work against your favor, but um, I want to be careful that I don't say anything it's like 100% because they are making some pretty drastic changes right now to the way they do the whole unified account mm -hmm. thing. But yeah, you should be able to carry them forward between both .ca and .com, no problem. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Chris is saying, what would you pay a sourcing agent? Uh, we're paying 8%. Seems to be pretty typical. Mm -hmm. Again, like we're actually paying less. Like everything that the sourcing agent is really priced <laughs> for us, we're actually saving money on and uh, same quality products or better in a lot of cases. They're actually, I mean, he's pretty awesome. Uh, is there a place to find good sourcing agents? Uh, come to the mastermind in, uh, in Hong Kong and you get to meet them in person. With sourcing agents too, um, most sourcing agents are going to have kind of an industry they specialize in. Um, you can find, I believe, Mike, yours is a little bit more of a catch-all, but for the most part, they tend to specialize in something, whether it's like textiles or electronics. So like your sourcing agent, Mike, if you're trying to develop... Um, uh, a new vacuum cleaner, a new ro robotic vacuum cleaner. He probably wouldn't be the guy to talk to, but if you're trying to source more of a commodity type item uh, and modify it a bit, a good fit. Um, but for the most part, they tend to be fairly industry specific. So it's more just networking, uh, getting referrals, like kind of we're doing here. That's the best way. There's not like a one website that you can go to where it's going to have a list of all the sourcing agents. The, the way it happened for us, um, you know, I got to the point where I felt like I wanted a sourcing agent. I wanted someone full-time in China because I was just like, you know, we, we, I was already going over there twice a year and it's it's a hardship doing that. And I didn't really want to have to do that for, for sourcing. I mean, th this year I could probably get away with not going <laughs> to China at all. Um, in fact, I'm not going to China on this next trip to Asia. I'm going to Hong Kong because we're having this mastermind and I'm speaking at Global Sources and there's some people that I want to meet and talk to there and I love Hong Kong. Uh, but from there, I'm going to the Philippines and spending two weeks in the Philippines office. So I'm getting an extra week in the Philippines office and skipping the China thing altogether. And I feel like I can do that because I have the sourcing agent. I don't really need to be there uh, as much anymore or if at all. Uh, and I wanted to kind of get to that point. Uh, so I was looking, you know, again, at hiring someone full time in China. And so I was asking around for people that were, that, uh, that knew people that were sourcing agents in China through, through my network and then, you know, asking around, uh, around in my my groups and stuff like that, and uh, eventually ran into the sourcing agent that we that we went uh, went with, and now we've been recommending him to as many people as we can because the guy is just amazing. But it was all through word of mouth. Uh, like someone, the next question here is, can you find sourcing agents at the Canton Fair? I mean, yes, they're like uh, parasites that are all over the place at the <laughs> Canton Fair. I would not trust any of them personally. Um, 
uh, it, they're, they're all over the place. They're, they're, you'll find them in official booths and you'll find them like tapping on your shoulder as you're walking down the hall and like, they don't, they don't want to let you, let you go. Um, you know, you need sourcing agent and you know, they'll break, it'll be in Chinglish and um, it, it's just not the type of person I want to be working with. I want someone like I have that guy like looks out for us uh, every step of the way they do quality control, everything point to point. Um, and it's just been a world of difference to us. So like, I think you want to find somebody like that. Um, Mike's asking, how many members are there in Ecom Crew Facebook group? I think uh, not everyone that's in premium has joined the Facebook group, but I think there's a couple hundred people in there now. 250-ish. 250. Um, and Mike's also asking, how is the Ecom Crew road trip project coming along? Funny you should ask. Um, we're setting up the first ones of those right now. I'm hoping to leave this coming weekend to do that. Um, and we're going to be doing uh, Arizona and Texas uh, cities first. Uh, so they're the unlucky guinea pigs. But if you happen to be in Arizona or Texas uh, and you're watching this webinar and you're interested in being a part of the roadshow, go to ecomcrew.com slash roadshow. Um, Lisa's asking, how often do you open up registration for premium? It's about every two to three months. And we're opening it uh, as of today. Uh, for, for, uh, so the last time we did it was in January. Um, so it's been about two months since this one. I think the next one's going to be about three months. So ecomcrew.com slash premium if you're interested in doing that. If not, we still love you and we'll be here uh, when you're ready. Uh, Terrence says, I agree with you. <laughs> uh, Ecom crew being totally worth it. Uh, please send a gift to my home address. <laughs> Terrence is an Ecom crew premium member. That's why, that's why it was funny. <laughs> uh, Okay, if you find a new supplier at the Canton Fair, do you try to negotiate price and order quantities right there at the booth at the fair? Is that customary and appropriate? Uh, definitely do, do not try to do that. I mean, you can definitely ask what's the price, you know, kind of get an idea of, you can ask them what the MOQ is, but we don't do negotiation then. I think it, uh, it seems smallish, I guess, or small ballish. Uh, you know, so we, we go back and compare other factories, uh, start sending emails and negotiating with them after the fact. Um, the things I want to talk to them about at the Canton Fair are going to be about things that are more difficult to discuss in an email later. So, like, it's easy to uh, to email about price and MOQ after the fact and negotiate that stuff. I want to be talking to them about quality, uh, specific features I'm looking for. Can they uh, do better packaging? Can they change materials? Uh, if it's something I'm really interested in, can I go visit their factory while I'm there? If they're in the Guan, uh, Guangdong area um, or, or Shenzhen area, uh, it's pretty easy to go do that. So um, those are the things I like to do while I'm there. Um, answer live. Uh, Terrence says, sorry if I missed it. I'm very interested in the mastermind. Uh, you say it'll be in California sometime. I actually think the next one that we're going to do after Hong Kong will probably be in Vancouver. And that'll be in uh, August. On the west coast of Vancouver Island as we're hiking around. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it'll probably be before or after that hike uh, in Vancouver. And we're going to do a remote mastermind as well, Terrence. You might have seen it in the Facebook group. If you didn't, search for it or email us and we'll send you the link. Uh, basically, we're just trying to get an interest group right now, seeing who's interested in joining one and who's not. And shortly, Abby or Maria will be sending out basically a questionnaire to people, see where you are in your business, because the big thing with a mastermind is you want people similar uh, points in their e-commerce journey to be in the same mastermind. It doesn't really do any good. Uh, somebody's first starting to be with somebody doing $30 million a year. Um, you kind of want people to be somewhat in the same position, uh, maybe a little bit of divergence there, but not too much of a gap. Uh, Colin is saying, are suppliers in China able to apply all the labels necessary so the products can go directly to the Amazon warehouse? Yes, we do that all the time. It is not a problem. And they do it for free. Best price ever. <laughs> John Lee says, I'm in Las Vegas. Um, I'm actually going to be in Las Vegas myself this weekend. Uh, is there much of a cost benefit for me to pick up my shipment at the port versus using a freight forwarder? Uh, that would be in the oh hell no category, a five hour minimum drive out to LA uh, and then back. Uh, there's better use of your time. That sounds miserable. My first time ever, my first shipment ever imported, what was it, about 100 boat anchors 
had a Chevrolet Cavalier, was about 22 years old, didn't want to pay a freight forwarder, drove down to the port. They don't actually go to the port, they go to a warehouse near the port. I went down to the warehouse, they basically took out the 100 anchors and said, okay, where's your truck? And I drove off on my Chevrolet Cavalier and the whole warehouse just started laughing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, you can get trucking for pretty cheap. Um, you do, you save yourself the trucking costs if you go pick it up yourself. If you have a truck, it's actually, you can actually do it. I mean, we've done it for quite a few shipments. Um, yeah, I mean, you can do it. It's a pain though, uh, but you can definitely do it. Um, Laurie says, do you have a referral for an India sourcing agent? Uh, we do, of. but uh, yeah, kind of, but we, we do. Um, is, uh, do we reserve that only for premium members, Dave, or do you want to put that in the chat? I think it's probably- I think more. we would have to, I, I don't know how much she's putting into the open. That's the bigger issue is- Yeah, we have to keep that confidential, I think. Uh, the only reason we do that, Lori, too, is number one, we do try to save some things for um, premium members just to make it worth, uh, worth it. Also, um, the sourcing agent, too, she's um, a little bit more low key. She doesn't want- uh, She's not trying to get every new client. So that's where we'd want to run it by her first before we sick all of our e-com crew webinar attendees onto her. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but she is amazing. She's awesome. Yes, she is. Uh, Kevin, does your sourcing agent actually go to the factory and do QC? Yes, and in fact, he's actually uh, going there proactively. I didn't even know he was doing this. Uh, someone's knocking, hello? <laughs> Hold on, let me, sorry. I'll take care of this. Uh, does your does your sourcing agent actually go to the factory and do the QC for you? So we also work with a uh, sourcing agent, basically a trading company, actually. And a big part of their markup is the actual inspection of going to the factory and making sure everything's up to snub. So whether you're dealing with a sourcing agent or a trading company, normally their quality is going to be way higher because they will have somebody on staff that actually specifically does product inspections and quality quality control. Uh, so that's a big benefit. And yeah, so they will normally do the uh, QC for you. It doesn't mean necessarily that you shouldn't do your own independent testing just to kind of keep them on their toes just to make sure uh, no funny work is going on. But normally they are going, going to have their own inspectors. Yep. Uh, okay, answer that. <coughs> uh, Nicole says that's great to know about the LLC. Um, yeah, you definitely don't need to open up an LLC. I would not, I mean, in fact, I would not do that. Uh, if you're Canadian, that sounds like a bad idea. Uh, Terrence says, uh, thank you, Mike and Dave. Vancouver sounds nice in August. I'll be in Bali. Uh, we'll check out the online mastermind. Uh, cool. Uh, Lori says she is a premium member, uh, which is awesome. Thank you, Lori. Uh, and please, yeah, just shoot, you have the, obviously the email address and I'll shoot you over our contact and I'm sure she'll be happy to hear from you. Uh, John says, I'd love to be able to meet you while you're in Las Vegas. Any chance I can run into you? Uh, normally I am like always like anytime I'm any place, I love to get to uh, meet people, but I am in Vegas a very short amount of time. I'm actually flying there to, or driving there actually to uh, meet the guy that's buying our business and then leaving immediately. So I don't think I'm going to have time this time. Um, but I'm in Vegas all the time um, and usually for much longer periods of time, but just this time it's a, a pretty short, uh, pretty inconvenient timing trip. Uh, Prosper's this weekend, which he's going to be there for that. And he asked me to come out there and, and meet with him for dinner. Um, so unfortunately I'm not going to have the time to do that, but I normally would love to do that. Uh, and I apologize because it's usually the answer is yes. Um, and that is the last question. Um, well, got through them all. It's always fun getting to the end. Dave, we can't hear you again, which is the best way to hear Dave. <laughs> there we go. There we go. I had, it, had myself on mic or on mute. Uh, First of all, I, think I gave a great answer about the whole quality inspection thing, and nobody got it. Curtis <laughs> uh, says, just started listening to the podcast and love it. Looking forward to watching the full recording. Absolutely. Glad you love it. We love having you guys. If it wasn't for you guys, we wouldn't be here doing this stuff, obviously. Still got a whole bunch of people in here. Anybody has any other questions? We're okay, we got one more. Nicole says, I'm registered as a sole proprietorship in Canada and most freight forwarders I've contacted don't work with sole proprietors. 
what would you recommend for legal setup of your business in Canada? That's a Dave question for sure. Cause I don't know anything about Canada other than it's cold <laughs> and there's maple syrup. Last time I came down to San Diego, Mike, it was nine degrees Celsius. Don't you get it's been awful here. About Canada being cold. It is, it has been, I mean, I don't know if I want to use the word miserable because you know, let's put things in perspective, but it's definitely not been warm, but it's changing. Finally this week, it's uh, on Thursday, it's breaking and going the other way. Finally. Yeah. It's, it's funny how it works. We're on the same, I guess, weather pattern here. It's sitting yep. with us two or three more days of the cold. Um, sole proprietor in Canada. I don't know why they wouldn't work with you because um, you should have a business number. If you don't have a business number then, or you're not registered, uh, with your business number, then yeah, that would be an issue. I don't know why though it would be an issue if you do have a business number. So yeah, I, yeah, we weren't a corporation when I first started the company in 2008, first two or three years was not a corporation, no problem. Um, yeah, I can't think of why that would be an issue. I was actually just sitting here thinking about uh, Vegas, John. Uh, Tuesday, actually, possibly for like a quick cop of coffee, maybe. If you send an email to a supporter, you come crew, um, might be able to work it out. It would just be relatively quick. And depending on what time we get in, how much traffic there is, well, we can uh, text or something on the way there and maybe grab a, grab a coffee on the way into town. You can try Pacific Customs Brokers, Nicole, pcb.ca. Um, but yeah, the whole sole proprietor thing shouldn't be an issue. There might be some other complicating factor there that maybe that uh, I'm just not hearing here. But yeah, sole proprietor shouldn't be an issue. Uh, it could just be a funny freight forwarder for whatever reason. Uh, Victoria is asking, do you recommend using Jungle Scout tools to look for products? Uh, I love Jungle Scout. I think it's an awesome tool. Uh, just be careful in the way that you use it. I mean, realize that everyone has access to Jungle Scout. I mean, it's like a an eight figure company um, because like everyone uses it and it's very popular. It's great software. They have lots of great training and lots of other people like show you how easy it is to, to find stuff on Amazon. Um, so just be careful in the way that you're using it. For me, like I'm trying to find ideas independently away from Jungle Scout. And then I use Jungle Scout to verify uh, more than anything, not to just start looking for stuff or I'm like putting in parameters and you know, I'll go to, I'll go to, do a search on Amazon and then run the Jungle Scout tool on that page and see the depth and the amount of sales on a particular term or an idea that I already have, um, if that makes sense. Uh, Terrence says, thanks so much. Have a great day. Can't wait for the warm weather. Terrence must be down here in uh, <laughs> SoCal too. It's been so cold. Uh, do you have knowledge about sales? Uh, Curtis is asking, do you have knowledge about sales tax collection for foreign companies? I'm Australian. Um, you know, the reality is, is that foreigners probably have very little to worry about when it comes to this, which is really frustrating for us sellers like myself. Um, because I think that zero fucks are given basically if you live abroad. Um, it's not obviously legal to, to ignore it, but, um, what are they going to do to you? So it, it's kind of a screwed up situation. I think that it's one of the things that needs to be fixed. Um, Nicole says, do you guys ever offer a discount on premium? Uh, we don't. Uh, I think that it's, we keep on raising the price actually. We just raised it again for this launch. Um, we're realizing as we get bigger, uh, we want to be able to provide a consistent level of support. So we we made new levels this, this time uh, to kind of help with that. So we have a, a an entry level version that doesn't come with email support. That's all the pre-recorded courses. Then we have the email support one. Then we have an even higher one because we get people asking uh, about consulting, uh, but realize that like the only thing that's not scalable in our business is Dave and ours and Mike's time. And we want to be able to provide, you know, good, good support. So we just, we can't offer a discount because it just, it takes a lot of time to answer emails. It's literally us doing it. Uh, it is not any, I mean, uh, Abby and Muffins and the other person about to hire, they do an amazing job in helping us free up our time to be able to do that. But uh, we don't want them being the ones answering the, the uh, members' emails because, um, you know, these are high-level questions that we typically are getting and you guys want to hear from us. That's what you're paying for access to. So we make sure that we provide that. So we can't do that at a discount. Um, let's see, do you recommend MC, this thing that you yeah, recommended, so Dave, I, I haven't used them. Yes. So, uh, yeah, give them an email, make, uh, 
again, shop around the rates a little bit, make sure the rates are competitive for what you're trying to do. But uh, assuming the rates are more, better than what you can get, absolutely. Um, Kevin says you mentioned requesting invoices from your supplier so you can see specific materials and components being used. Is this pretty standard and customary request? The reason I ask is because I worry that my supplier will think I'm trying to go around them and find their sources. Should I just not worry about that because it's a standard request? So like, for example, a really common example is zippers if you're doing like a fabric thing. And the big zipper is a YKK zipper. Now, a lot of suppliers will buy counterfeit YKK zippers. So asking them for a verifiable uh, proof of where they're buying their zippers from to make sure that it, it is legitimate perfectly normal. Now you don't want to, again, it's an inconvenience for them. So you do want to kind of temper how often you inconvenience them. You don't want to ask for invoices of every single component that might not necessarily be a critical component, but the critical components, absolutely. It's uh, fairly standard practice. So uh, in the past, for example, we import a lot of stainless steel products, wanting to see some verifiable proof of where they're getting their stainless steel from, completely acceptable. And the truth of it is like, if you can find out where they're buying their zippers from, well, that's only one part of the whole equation. Now, if you're asking them for something that's kind of proprietary to them, then that becomes more sensitive. But it's, if it's simply a component that gives you no value, then there should be no problems. Um, Victoria is asking, so where do you guys go to look for ideas? So, I mean, this is uh, like really the whole foundation of Ecom Crew Premium. Like there's, there's two full length courses about this specifically. Um, which is like, you know, 10 hours of content per course. So I can only get into it so much uh, here at the end of this webinar. But you know, first we're looking for, we're looking to build brands, not just sell products. That's the, the base of everything we do. We're looking to build like long-term legitimate businesses here. We're not looking to just sell widgets. Um, so you know, we're looking for a niche first. And so there's a whole thing about like how to pick a niche. Um, and there's a couple of podcasts that we've done about this. Um, I think are actually one of them is uh, how to pick the perfect product. I think is the name of it. Uh, maybe Dave, you can try to find that episode number real quick, but it's actually was our num number one or two podcast episode of last year. That's a great place to start. It gets into the types of things we're looking for, but the, the big ones are, you know, things that people are passionate about. You know, we're looking for niches that the people are, are, are passionate about, that there's a direct Facebook audience for that. Uh, ideally people are going to buy more than one of your widget and it's even more ideally consumable. Um, you know, these types of things are the things that we're looking for in terms of like high level ideas. And once you find the niche you're looking for, that all becomes way, way easier, you know, cause it's like, like let's say your, your niche is adult coloring. Well now, you know, there's only so many answers of where you're going to go. You're going to have coloring books and gel pens, pencils, markers, et cetera. Um, you know, if Dave's doing off-roading, you know, there's only, even though there's lots of, there's lots of depth to the, to the niche, there's only so many things you can do. So it's, you know, like uh, towing rope and truck top tents and ladders or uh, other accessories and things like that. Um, you know, so those things kind of naturally fall into place, but that's basically how we do it. And then, you know, as we find that, that niche, then it's like drilling down into, um, using Jungle Scout at that point to look at an individual product and making sure that it, it actually makes sense. Um, Kevin says, uh, and these I'm are going to be- I'm going to have to run after this question. Yeah, I was going to say this has to be the last question. So, um, but when visiting the Canton Fair, are there things you should look for or things to ask to make sure that suppliers are legit? Yes. Um, so, you know, I will ask, are they a factory or a sourcing agent? I mean, just more to see if they're lying to me or be, uh, being honest, because a lot of booths there are sourcing agents trying to be a factory and they're not actually a factory. So I'll ask those questions. Uh, where, where are they located? Like how many employees do they have? Who are some of their, their uh, other people they work with? Can we get references? Did they already sell to the U.S. or not? That's a big one for me, uh, making sure that they, do, they, they have been importing the products in the U.S., uh, things of this nature. Um, can I come visit their factory? Uh, even if I have no intention of going to visit their factory, uh, the ones that are open arms welcoming you to like come visit their factory uh, is a good sign when they're, they're like, uh, oh, you know, a little bit off, off, uh, standoffish about it or, uh, or, or wishy-washy about it. It's usually not a good, a good sign. Um, so those are some of the things that I do when I'm there. Dave might have a couple other ideas. 
Yeah, the one thing to add to what Mike said, uh, put a time qualifier on things like, have you ever exported to the States? Who are your customers? So if they say they've worked with Walmart, when did you work with Walmart? Was right. it, do you work with them now or was it 20 years ago and we have absolutely no way to verify that what you're saying is true? So always put a time qualifier on anything like that. Uh, but yeah, I think everything you mentioned there is pretty dead on. It's like terms everyone of like, says they work with Walmart. It's actually pretty yes. funny. Oh, we work with Walmart. It's like, really? Okay. Like what? Are, it's actually funny you say that because that, that's a, it's like an inside joke there. Uh, but yeah, most of the, most of the companies there are legitimate. That's not the issue. It's just figuring out if they have legitimate pricing, legitimate quality. Uh, those are the bigger, the bigger issues that you're going to run into. But most of the factories there are almost a hundred percent. They've made a serious commitment in terms of money and time to be there. They're not there simply to steal your money. They might have poor quality products, maybe that are more uh, appropriate for like a developing country than necessarily a Western country. So those are the things that you should be looking for more than anything else is making sure that their quality is up to snub. And Colin says, thanks guys, you're doing a great job. Thank you very much. Um, and Victoria uh, said that she was putting those in the wrong place, but I think I answered her question. So, and that's gonna do it. We both need to run. Uh, it is lunchtime here on the West Coast of the United States and North America where Dave's up. So thank everyone for, for coming. There's still a ton of people here. Uh, most of them are probably like not even paying attention anymore realistically, which, you know, I, I'm used to this with Dave when he starts talking, I lose focus in about 90 seconds. So you guys have discovered what I've known for a long time. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. <laughs> You're welcome. I love uh, you too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, um, uh, well, put, also the video will be posted on YouTube where Mike can't ridicule me, but on the YouTube oh, video. I'll find too. a way, Dave. Come on now. I'll find a way. <laughs> you can post any questions on the YouTube video and uh, somebody will get back to you there too. Registration for the Master Vancouver Mastermind. Last one does not open yet because we still have to plan it. But uh, once it does, we'll send out a, an email to our list. So make sure that you're on our email list somewhere or the other. You probably are though, if you're got the registration invite for this webinar. Uh, so probably, probably we'll send it out. August or, or sometime in like mid to late August or early September would probably okay. be, and, and it's not guaranteed yet, but that's just kind of what we've been talking about. So, all right, gotta go. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. See ya, bye-bye. Bye-bye.